right. So uh, welcome you guys that have joined us to our April session of the Daring to Learn uh, value-added webinar series. My name is Elena Boyd. Uh, I'm an extension assistant with the UT Center for Profitable Agriculture. I see we have some new folks on, some names I don't recognize, and uh, we had quite a few folks register. Um, so we should have a lot of first timers uh, watching this recording, hopefully. And um, I wanted to welcome you um, to our session. We have uh, Dr. Michelle Childs from the University of Tennessee's Department of Retail, um, Hospitality and Tourism Management. And she is going to be uh, going over the basics of branding with us this morning um, and this afternoon for you folks that are in Eastern time. So I will go ahead and um, give her a chance to introduce herself. And um, I can leave this up if you want, or you can go ahead and share whatever works for you. Great, thanks, Elena. I appreciate the invite um, and just sharing a little bit more about branding. So, um, so I've been at the University of T Tennessee for eight years um, into my ninth year, and my main area is within branding, so retail branding. And so I've done a lot of different uh, projects as it relates to value-added products, uh, particularly within the dairy industry as it relates to branding. And then this workshop that I'll be presenting today, um, we presented live a couple weeks ago, um, to folks that are interested in value-added products. So really, this is going to be the foundations of branding um, to really help grow from there. So I'd love for this to be as interactive as possible. So please, if you have questions, you can put it in the chat or just unpause yourself and, um, and we can go from there. But thank you for the invite again. And hopefully um, we all learned something new. So I will go ahead and let you screen share now. Um, and just to let you know, so our folks, um, they won't be able to turn their cameras on, um, but we do have a chat box. You guys should be able to uh, put your comments in there. And uh, you can also use that Q&A box or um, it'll let you raise your hand. So if you have uh, a question and uh, need to ask, uh, you've got a couple different ways to uh, get that information to us. Right. I think because I have multiple screens, um, it is showing you the notes slide, which I don't want. Okay, I think we're good. Okay, um, so um, I'm, this is really part of a larger team. So um, I'm Michelle Childs and I also worked on this project. So I just wanna give um, some credit where credit is due in terms of where the, where the project uh, stems from. And so my collaborators are listed here, uh, Christopher Sneed, uh, Jeannie Lim and Megan LaFue from your office. So this is really all about uh, branding and I'm gonna be presenting more about sort of the basics um, as we work through branding. So we already did an introduction about me. Um, so my areas within retail and merchandising management um, at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. And so, as I mentioned, I really focus on branding and the branding concepts can be really applied to any industry. So uh, my students, you know, they're really mostly interested in a lot of like, um, could be fashion products or grocery products or anything to do with retail. And so when I'm teaching them about branding, these concepts are really those core concepts that we can use to build off when we think about any product category. So first off, I'll start with what is a brand, right? We've heard that term before. Um, we can probably think of a few brands, uh, maybe some we're wearing, maybe some we're using, uh, maybe some we're eating. Um, but this is really, when we think about holistically, what is a brand? This is the combination of those elements, right? So we think a brand name, 
might be associated words, logos, symbols, or those design elements um, that really help create that image in our mind about what is that brand. And I'll give some examples later. And really what it comes down to is the value is in the brand, right? So we can buy a pair of basic sunglasses, right? They serve the purpose of protecting our eyes from the sun. But the moment we put a brand symbol on the side of it, right? Consumers are willing to pay more. They recognize it. Um, they might associate it with certain levels of quality, right? So if we have sort of maybe a high-end brand name to it, we might associate that with different levels of quality, right? And obviously with that comes price. So really when you think about developing your brand, right, these elements that are associated with it build off of this. And this is what resonates with consumers, right? So that value is in the brand. So it's really worth developing a brand, it's associated images because of the associated level of quality and the price that uh, customers are willing to pay. So, I, I wanted to make this as interactive as possible. So the next couple slides, I will actually go through these branding elements, um, but I just wanna really think about like where everybody is on this call um, in their brand development. So can you describe your brand or, do you, so a narrative, which I'll go over in just a minute, right? How do you describe your brand to others? How did you come up with your logo? Um, and how do others describe your brand, right? So think about these things because these are going to be those associated elements that's with your brand. Um, so let me just check the chat to see if we have anybody that's interested in sort of interacting. Okay, so yeah, family farm store that produces plants, produce and products. Okay, so um, can you describe a little bit more about like how you come up with your like brand images. So it could be brand logo. It could be maybe how you um, brand yourself online or even on social media. So we are Fleur de Lis Farm. Uh, we're a military family originally from Louisiana. So Fleur de Lis represents where we're from originally. Um, mm -hmm. So anybody that's from Louisiana me immediately recognizes that no matter where we're at as well. Um, mm -hmm. So it kind of puts a little bit of family spin on our farm name. And um, we have all of our product line comes from our farm. Like it's a farm store, but it's all from our farm. Mm -hmm. So we try to really resonate with people that our product line, we know exactly where it came from and the value that goes into it. Okay, great, great. Yeah, so it sounds like there is like a narrative there. So in a narrative, I'll go over actually in the next couple of slides, but it sounds like there's a really interesting story to tell. And um, I'm curious sort of how you tell that story. Is it like on your website or social media or anything like that? So we have a website with our farm store on the website, um, everything but our um, chicken and flour bouquets are available on the website like we don't ship either of those um but they're both available for purchase so we have everything in our story on the website and then we do a lot on um, instagram and facebook okay great 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 and so do you have a brand logo associated we do it's a fleur de lis that has our farm name over the top of it okay great great how did you come up with that so we're from Louisiana and Fleur de Lee was the one thing that all the adults in the family could agree on. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that was a, that was a challenging task in the beginning was just to come up with a name that everybody could agree on. So we felt like it was a tie to our family history because we left um, our family farm that my grandfather started because um, my husband will retire here uh, from the army to move here. So we wanted to still be able to, pay tribute to our farm there as well. Right, 
Right. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a lot of heritage there, I think, um, in your story, um, in your narrative. So yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. You're welcome. Is there anyone else um, on the call that would like to share a little bit more about describing their brand, their brand story, how they came up with their logo? And if there is anyone else that wanted to share um, to maybe kind of talk, I can give you guys permission to talk. Um, if you just want to raise your hand or pop something in the chat box. Thank you. Great, so please interrupt me um, if I miss anything from the chat or anything like that. So I'm really gonna be talking about, so thanks Danielle for sharing that, um, that story. So I'm gonna be talking about each of these elements. So identity, voice, promise, values, targeting, and positioning. So it does seem a little bit like overwhelming, like, oh my gosh, all these elements from um, a branding mix, but they're all really connected. So kind of when I explain one, it, it'll really help um, inform another. And then the targeting and the positioning point is really taking those brand elements and focusing them on a particular customer. So aligning the needs of your customer with your product. So, um, so let's sort of jump in. So when we think about brand voice, right? This is really that personality and emotion that you infuse in your company's communication. So Really vaguely speaking is how do you communicate your brand to customers, right? So is it going to be something more like light and fun loving, or is it really going to emphasize sort of the heritage piece? Is it really going to emphasize more of the sustainability piece or whatever really your focus in? So all of these elements is, are going to be consistent, right? So you'll have a consistent brand voice as you speak with your customer. So when I say speak with your customer, it could be not only through direct channels, but it's also like on product packaging. It's also on um, your face-to-face -face communication or your website or your social media, right? So think about trying to understand a little bit more about these pieces because those are going to build on each other as we think about holistically how we're going to communicate our brand. And so brand identity are those recognizable aspects in line with consumers, Right. So this could be color palette, logo, font, lettering. Right. Think about like the physical presentation of your company. So it could be, say, you are at a farmer's market. Right. How you merchandise your products. Right. Consistently using that piece. So I think it's worthwhile thinking about. OK, so what are the colors we're going to use in all of our communications? Like what's our sort of color story? Right. Logo. So each of you are probably at different stages in terms of your logo development or how you had developed your logo. So, um, you know, it could be consistently on products or, um, you know, I've, I've talked to some folks and they have like multiple logos, too many, you know, so kind of like thinking about like that consistent brand identity is also really important. And then in terms of font lettering, right, it could be font lettering, could be packaging, right? Um, sometimes we think about, oh, this will uh, be convenient for now to package in this way to customers, but really every element really describes the brand as it relates to that physical presentation of your product. I'll just pause for questions if there's any questions. And Elaine, if I'm missing anything in the chat, uh, feel free to let me know too. Okay, so brand promise. Okay, so, right, so we have that brand voice, the presentation of the brand. And so brand promise is really how you articulate these aspects of your business to customers. So it could be your mission and, and vision statement. So oftentimes on websites, Right. We have like the narrative of our brand, which is this is the story of like our family farm, how it's developed, what our focus is. But what's different about a brand promise is it's more of its like vision and mission statements that really help 
uh, create that value for customers. So for example, oftentimes people say about natural ingredients or they talk about the sustainability piece, right? So these are that value that you're delivering to customers that's above and beyond other products. And the reason why this is important is, you know, there's an image of soap there, right? If we have, right, that consistent, that strong value proposition to customers, right, they may be attracted to those elements compared to sort of the utility of the product. So what I mean by that, again, using the soap example, right, we can buy soap everywhere. Um, what's the difference, you know, that you are delivering as part of your brand promise that's different than other products and which consumers are willing to pay more for? right? Could be natural ingredients, as I mentioned, right? Could be that everything was handmade or um, that you're utilizing these sustainable practices, right? So these elements need to be communicated to customers so that they can align their value with your value proposition. So the reason why consumers might be more attracted to your product, right, are could be more than the actual utility, right? So soap washes our hands, um, but they might be more attracted to that value above and beyond, uh, which is the brand promise. So values are really consistent with this, right? Beliefs that our company stands for that then align with our brand. So as you can see, right, they're really building on top of each other so that we can have this consistent image, right, about our uh, branding elements. So our color scheme, our logo, our font, um, and then on top of that, really those promises and those values that you want to deliver to your customers. So when I move through this, right, thinking about, okay, so we have those elements, we have those values, those promises, right? And then targeting and positioning are layered on top of that in terms of, okay, so now that we know our product has these particular promises, these values, these elements, right? Targeting is really positioning your product so that you can reach your consumer. So aligning your product with your consumer. So targeting is then, I'm, I'm really going to communicate these elements to customers so that when those customers care about those values, they're thinking about my product, right? So I'll take a couple steps back from there. So um, brand targeting is about determining, right, the segment you want to reach based on what your product is offering, right? So I'll use more of a simple example is I want to target customers that are interested in more natural ingredients um, and more sustainable elements, right? So you communicate that in your product offering and then you target those particular customers, and then, right, positioning is really aligning your product with your target so that these elements align. So really, this is where our brand stands in the eyes of consumers. You want it to be as perfectly positioned as possible, right? So those that you're targeting is really looking for your type of product. Okay, so that was a lot of information. <laughs> um, so I just want to pause and digest that information um, to see if anybody has questions or if they want to just share a little bit more as they're working through these pieces to see if there's um, something maybe that I can explain a little bit further. So I think it's almost helpful to sort of write down these pieces, you know? So what's our brand values? What are our branding elements? Who are we trying to target? How do we position, right? And then you can see sort of visually how everything aligns with one another. So I'll just pause for a second to see if anybody has any questions. Oh, looks like we do have one. Right. So Danielle has sent us some more stuff in the Q&A box. 
And I'll let you, can you see those, Michelle? Yeah, I can, thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Okay, great, Danielle. Perfect, right. So eco-friendliness, commitment to sustainability, and then you're targeting, right, someone that is looking for these high quality products that also, right, are, you know, satisfy the need for like deliciousness and then also healthy. So... Okay, that's great, yeah. So, um, right, so you are essentially, right, communicating the value and the promise to customers, right? So commitment to eco-friendly, sustainability, um, quality of products, and then aligning that with your target customer. So you care about these values and these and and um, and these elements, and this is sort of the product for you, and making sure that it all lines up. So one thing I'd sort of add to this is I think having a, so I got distracted by a chat. Try again. Okay, great. Thanks, Elena. So yeah, one thing I'd sort of add to this is sort of mapping that out. So what I mean by that, Danielle, is more like, Okay, so I'm gonna come up with three keywords that are gonna describe our products and our values. And then I'm gonna think about how I can communicate that to customers and then have, how do I sort of target that, that to customers? And so you've probably already done this, but um, even mapping it out or writing it out can make you see how it all sort of stacks on each other as well. Hopefully I didn't miss any questions. I don't see any more, but just to let okay. you guys know, if you were having any issues trying to put anything in this chat box now, you should be able to send stuff. Um, so we should be able to see those if anyone wanted to try again. Great, thank you. Okay, so um, really this slide is to really sort of look for volunteers. You don't have to have the answer for all of these, um, but I do think it's helpful to learn from each other in, um, in identifying what are these different elements. So if there's anybody on the call that really wants to help, you know, walk yourself through this, um, then I can kind of help you articulate what are each of these elements. So working through voice and identity and promise, values, target, and positioning. And again, you don't have to have a perfect answer or have all the answers, um, but it is helpful to sort of walk through that as it relates to your own brand. And it looks like we do have another question in the Q&A section. Okay, so um, this question here is about, do you think you need to focus on target customers or best need to communicate to a broader audience? Okay, so um, your target audience doesn't have to be small, right? It just has to align with what your promise and values are. So not everybody is going to be your target customer. If you target everybody in a value-added product, I think that it can get overwhelming and probably a little bit inconsistent in your communication. So if you're trying to target everybody, like could be a valued customer, right? Looking for value. Um, another customer that's looking for high quality ingredients. Well, those two things don't align, right? So quality is associated with price, right? Which is usually associated with other elements, right? So could be handmade or sustainable, right? That tends to increase the quality and increase the price. So targeting everybody, um, even though you want a big audience, sometimes can make the communications to the customer inconsistent. So that's all I'm really saying. I, I wouldn't want to say you, your target audience needs to be really niche and really small, but it just needs to be 
focus so that you can then be consistent because consistent brands in all of their elements is going to be more effective at communicating to customers. So when we think about when we think about brands that we really really know, right? I'm going to just throw out a couple of brands like uh Target um could be McDonald's or uh, you know, I have a bottle of water here. Um when you think about like the consistency of the brand communication, we we are or say Starbucks, right? We know what to expect when we walk into those particular retailers because they're of their consistent communication and we can describe that. So that's all that's all I'm saying. Um I hope that answered your question. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I think I, am I unmuted? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I can volunteer. Um Great. My my name is Pierre Ann, and we have a, a poultry farm. We do um, chicken and turkey. Uh, our farm name is Yellowbird Creek Restoration Farm. Um, the name basically came from my son just seeing a yellow bird by a creek on our property, and it was just cute. And therefore, we decided to go with that since it fitted the fact that we do do poultry. Um, and and I made the logo myself, which is a yellow bird with our name of our farm. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of our history. Um, and so far, we have mostly done um, peer uh, kind of people we know, small events. Uh, I've been part of doing, you know, kind of buying club drop-offs and things like that. Uh, so I try to target people instead of doing social media and things target more local mm -hmm. uh, and people that already have tended to purchase um, things that like we produce or, or, or products, let's say, you know, like Azure standard, things like that are brands that are kind of known to be, you know, organic and things like that. So those people tend to be a little bit more willing to, um, you know, to be open-minded to our product. Excellent. Great. And I think too, um, you know, thanks so much for sharing that. It's helpful to be um, interactive in these types of mm -hmm. um, environments. So I appreciate that. I would encourage you to think about, so it, you have the, you have it there, but I would mm -hmm. think, encourage you to think about almost articulating those in a very specific way mm -hmm. so that you can then sort of build on it. So what I mean by that is you're saying that we're targeting customers that care about certain things. So what would those things, what, what are those elements that they would care about? And then how do you sort of build off of that piece too? And I and I know all of you on this call have like a million hats that you're wearing. <laughs> and one more is marketer and brander. Um, so um, I understand there's a, there's a lot of things sort of happening at once when you're thinking about value-added products. Um, but I think articulating it is almost as effective because then every thought after that needs to relate to what that is. Does that make sense? Hopefully that was helpful. Um, so Danielle, you said, is it okay to target in a product specific way, like men for hot sauce and women for flowers? So definitely yes. And and I had this question before and it made me think a little further is, um, it was actually um, a wine company. They made their own wine, but they had different labels for different uh, types of wine. And they were worried that they had too many target audiences and that, in fact, they were trying to sort of do it all and they were not as focused. So what I answered, which I think is, is helpful for your situation too, is think about like your brand is more like an umbrella. You want to be more consistent with everything underneath that. So even if you're targeting men for hot sauce, like what are the types of things that they would care about that women for flowers would also care about? And then that is going to make sure that it's consistent throughout. And so you're not, 
I'm using more simple examples here, and I'm sure your example is much more complicated, but could be, I mean, if someone's looking for um, quality versus value, right, those are two different things, but you want to make sure that underneath that, if men are looking for hot sauce and women are looking for flowers, that those those umbrella elements are still there. And it sounds like for you, it's going to be quality ingredients and quality of products and sort of a um, uh, I can't think of the right word, but more like a is sort of um, a care in the product, right? So more of like a slow movement in the product versus um, versus more like valued and generic. Does that help? Okay, great, great, yeah. So it doesn't have to be complicated. It could be, you know, care and ingredients and quality and like sustainable or anything like that. That's really sort of that umbrella piece. And oftentimes you will have lots of products, right? Lots of products that you have different types of customers to. Um, but in order to be consistent in your branding pieces, um, think about it as more of like an umbrella. Okay, so how do you keep it sorted as far as social media? So what I think you're getting at is how do you communicate that those types of images on social media? So I would actually go back to the first, the second slide about identity. And so in social media, you want to make sure that you have like consistent sort of color scheme, consistent fonts in any sort of language that you use, um, and then consistent sort of symbols. And then that will help round out your social media if you're posting different things that might target different audiences. So it's more of like um more of, I don't want to say color story, but it's more of like a um like a storybook that sort of matches as you are um communicating that on social media. Great questions. Yeah, great. Great. It looks like we have another that asks, um, so our message our message should not just be our story, but something that supports the first thought that comes to mind for the customers. Okay, yeah. Right or wrong. So, yeah, so your story would more be about like your, your narrative. So that would be more like your heritage or your background that you communicate to the customers. Um, but the, I didn't see the last part of that question. Sorry, I can pull it back up. Thanks. So in the, um, it asks again, I'll just reread it. Um, so our message should not just be our story, but something that supports the first thought that comes to mind uh, for the customers. Okay, yeah, I think I'm not totally maybe capturing the essence of your question, but what I think you're asking is more, yeah, they're they're different in terms of like narrative and story. That's more of like about us, right? That sort of about us section on a website that might share like how your firm came about and what types of things you care about and um, you know, what's your processes and your values and things like that. But when customers think of a product, um, I mean, there's there's a number of things that could, they could think about, um, but you want it to be connected to a piece of that, right? So when they think about your product, I'll use quality as an example, right? That if you communicate sort of that care and process within your story, do you want to make sure, yeah, that when they think about your brand, they might think about some of these elements. Um, but, you know, customers are exposed to, you know, thousands of products every day and all these stimuli, right? But you want, in order to stand out, consistency is key. Um, so I think I'm getting at your question, but I think it's that second part that maybe I'm not quite understanding. Hopefully I got to it. So I think this is a really good opportunity to share with each other. So um, 
you know, what is like working and not working for you all? You know, what seems to be working in terms of attracting your customers or retaining your customers, what seems to not be working? And then also, I always like to add something like what seems to be the most trickiest part? And so I say labor intensive, but it, it just sometimes could be, you know, if something doesn't feel as natural, sometimes it can feel as hard. And so for some folks, this is like social media. They're like, I, I'm so overwhelmed that interacting on social media seems really hard. Whereas others, right, it's more of like organically a part of what they do in terms of branding. So I just want to take this opportunity for others to maybe share with each other about what seems to might be working um, and maybe some points of contention or trickiness that they've tried, but maybe isn't working. Oh, that is interesting. <laughs> um, okay, trickiest part is the biggest seller varies so much from week to week. Oh, yes. Okay. Um, I really wish I had an answer for that one. Um, so why, why do you think that is? Um, what are some examples of the, the hottest seller that might vary from week to week? Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that is, I wonder, gosh, um, I don't know if I have a good answer for that one. <laughs> Zero pause one week to sell the next. Um, yeah, I, you know, it could be so many different things. Danielle, it could be, I mean, yeah, wasting product. Yeah. That would be frustrating. Um, could be like even things like merchandising or events or, um, you know, I'm thinking like maybe there's, you know, Mother's Day or something like that. I'm sure you account for all of those things. Um, but um, that in turn, I, I actually, I, I don't have a straight answer for that, but I'm almost wondering if, if um you could keep track of things like, um, like even on an Excel document, like time of year or like weather or something like that, that might help find a pattern, help, um, help the thing is planning on social media. Okay, great. Yes. Um, because it can be, social media is supposed to be very interactive, right? So I think planning some of that, there are some softwares that you can use, um, maybe use some, or maybe you just kind of think it through, um, for planning in social media in advance and like what that post might be. Um, and so some, some people don't really know that the, um, the right amount. So really social media is supposed to be social, right? So the key thing is if someone interacts with you, you know, interacting back in a timely fashion, two to three posts a week seem to be sort of like that sweet spot. Sometimes too much can feel overwhelming or too little. You're not connecting with your customer. Um, so where to find new customers that are a target customer? Great. Yeah, great question. Um, so this is where I really tend to talk about sort of the 80-20 rule, which we've probably heard before, right? 80% of our sales will come from 20% of our customers. So developing, finding that customer is the, the most expensive part, right? The most labor intensive part. But then once you have them, keeping them is much easier, right? So um, interacting and being consistent 
um, particularly right within branding is going to help keep those customers. So you'll want to focus more on, of course, finding new customers is important, but once you do have them, keeping them as loyal and consistent as possible is also really going to help your business and also be less sort of labor intensive, right? So the first step, finding them interacting with them, selling something to them is going to be sort of that heavy lift. But, you know, collecting things like their, um, you know, their email or connecting on social media or something like that is going to be that less, in table, less intensive, labor intensive piece that will keep them and capture them to be more 80% of your business. So hopefully that helps. So I really want to talk about, um, again, please interrupt at any time if there's still questions or, or anything like that, um, sort of the benefits. So I think oftentimes when we think about like marketing and branding, it people kind of either love it or it's like the last thing they want to work on. <laughs> um, so I really like to talk about sort of the benefits of putting these efforts in, in the consistency of these different branding elements, right? So product differentiation, pricing opportunities, and brand loyalty. So we know, right, that there's so many products out there that are targeted to consumers, right? So if you can differentiate your product from those within the market, even slightly through your value statement, right, or your narrative, right, connecting with customers are going to help that differentiation so that they choose you over others. It also, right, provides pricing opportunities. So consumers are willing to pay more, right, if they have that connection. So there's even products that I purchased that I'm like, it's probably easier and cheaper to buy elsewhere, but I feel like a connection with that product or with that company or with that brand or with the mission that I'm willing to pay more to support that. And then I've already mentioned about this brand loyalty piece, right? So that 80% of your 80 of your business will come from those loyal small group of customers as well. So fostering that piece is going to be really important when we think about like the longevity of our brand and also sort of the consistency of purchasing with um, with customers. So I'm kind of thinking, you know, if we can talk a little bit about maybe some efforts that you have seen that are going to be beneficial for your company in terms of branding efforts, or maybe some obstacles, and then hopefully either myself or the team here can really talk about possible solutions for those obstacles. So what are sort of those benefits that you see that you have, you know, oh, I've spent significant more time on social media. Now I see, you know, a more loyal interactive base or obstacles that you've had is, oh, I keep developing a newsletter and consistently put it out, but it's not really generating business for me, something like that. Um, so what do you all have in terms of benefits or obstacles? If it's easier for some of you guys to speak rather than type, um, you can raise your hand uh, with the little raise hand button in the bottom um, of the screen and I can give you permission to talk. Okay, so great question. What's the best way to monitor um, the effect of marketing for small firms? This is kind of tricky for any marketing dollar, um, but keeping keeping some track of where you spend your where you spend your efforts. So it could be financial efforts or even sort of labor efforts, and then keeping track of what are the results from that is going to be the best way. So rather than sort of throwing out a big net and really hoping that oh, something will sort of happen, try to try to at least 
record, you know, it doesn't have to be like a fancy Excel or anything, but just at least record sort of what efforts were put in and then what has come out. So it, there's not really, there isn't a really best answer like, oh, the only way is through social media or the only way is through direct marketing or anything like that. So um, it's just really dependent on your customer, your target audience and your product offering. Um, but having some system to monitor that is going to be a way that you can sort of test where your efforts are going and what are the results from it. So I've heard some people that say like, definitely um, Facebook advertising has good, been good for them. I've seen some people that are like, my customer isn't really on Facebook. Um, it's all about, you know, getting their email address and letting them know when new products are out and things like that. So um, it actually is really dependent from business to business. Can I ask you something real quick? You mentioned um, like Facebook posts making two to three a week. Like what about the stories and real aspects? Like how many of those do you feel make sense? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so because they um, like stories disappear over 24 hours, that's more of like a daily or or um, you'll want to have something up. You'll want to have something up over that sort of 24 hour period. So that consumers, it doesn't have to be like multiple, but just some sort of interaction with those customers. So actually they're getting more traction than even posts um, when we think about sort of like effectiveness of that. So um, if possible, I mean, it's not possible every day when you're juggling a lot of things, but I would try to have like some sort of interaction with customers that are available um, when it's too many, I think sometimes it can be overwhelming for customers. So, but having that like consistency, so either, you know, either something 24 hours or even 36, just to kind of keep that consistency because it does disappear. Whereas a post, they can kind of go through it and it, and it could be, it could go to the top of their feed, even though it's a couple of days old. But I think sort of playing around um, with, you know, the interaction that it generates is going to also be important too. And um, it's hard to sort of keep track of something like that. But I think as long as you have like a, a consistent presence in that, in stories and reels, then that's going to help custom keep front of mind to customers. Great questions. Um, uh, this, I will. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I can um kind of answer um Pierre's next question. Um, so she asks um. How do you recommend handling a Facebook account? Uh, she says that she has um, struggles with keeping the Facebook friends versus the business separate. Um, and I will let you guys know, uh, coming up in just a couple months, we're gonna have a, a webinar session going over that, um, kind of handling Facebook and Instagram um, and the meta business suite. Uh, but if you guys are not already, I would recommend um, utilizing the meta business suite uh, for your Facebook and Instagram accounts. It makes it pretty easy. Um, you can plan posts, try to schedule out that way. And uh, that way you're not uh, maybe having to post on your personal page and you can keep things a little bit more separate that way. Great answer. I'm glad you're having a workshop on it. It's so much more complicated than just one or two answers. Um, so I'm glad you can have a workshop on it. That'd be really helpful. Great. So I'm really open to if you have any questions. Um, even if you think of it later, you can always email me or reach out to Elena um, and, um, and I'll get those questions answered. But some really good questions today. And I really, in total, 
I would just try to spend time to think about like, what is your brand about? What do you identify with? What are those key areas that how you would describe yourself or maybe how others would describe it? And then you build off that. So then you constantly are like, oh, if I package my product this way, does it match, you know, my brand image? Or if I sell through these channels, does that match, right? Because consistency is going to be the most important piece when we think about building an effective brand. And oh my goodness, we're on time. That's the first time I've ever been on time. <laughs> In our presentation, I love talking. So um, yeah, good for us. Yeah, um, the questions that you guys had were really great. Uh, we've got time for a couple more, um, if anyone has anything else. And I will go ahead now. Um, I'll share this attendance and evaluation form with you. So um, if this is your first time on a Daring to Learn session um, and you guys are unfamiliar, uh, at the end of every session um, each month, we uh, put this screen up with the QR code and the link. Um, if you are one of our Tennessee-based producers who um, you're looking for TAEP credit, that's the Tennessee Ag Enhancement Program. Um, if you fill this out and um, check that you are uh, seeking TAEP educational credit, uh, we will make note of that. And um, this is just a good way for you guys to share your feedback with us as well. Um, so any comments, concerns, um, support, anything that uh, you may wanna share with us about this session or other sessions, um, feel free to fill that evaluation form out. And uh, we can hang around for a couple more minutes if you guys have any um, other questions for Michelle. Great, right. well, thank not, you all. And um, thank you so much for having me. Um, I really appreciate it and um, looking forward to hearing from anybody if there's any questions. Great. I'm glad it was good info. Thank you. Yeah. And if you guys don't have any questions, um, feel free to hop off. Uh, you're more than welcome to go at any time.